Is this on silent? That's fine. We're live now. We're going. Okay. So I can cut off. I can cut the beginning. You can just go with it. Yeah, we can cut wherever. Yeah. Because it's not going to be just me being an asshole going, Welcome to the Grappling we re- See, exactly. Grappling Rewind Podcast. Today we're going to be breaking down Fight to Win Pro 53 in Maryland, as well as some new judo rules. So, uh, initially, Fight to Win Pro 53, hosted in Frederick, Maryland, uh, started off with eight or nine um, purple belt matches, followed by nine to, I think, actually ten Maybe someone should learn how to count first before he says eight or nine. There's eight purple belt matches, followed by 10 brown belt matches and 12 black belt matches. Overall, a really good card. Uh, the total payout for the card was just shy of $33,000, $32,606, which is a pretty decent payout for a um, submission grappling card, especially in 2017. Always good to see the athletes getting paid. Um, you know, just good things all around. Seth actually has a goal of paying out all of the athletes a total of $1 million. They're hoping to hit the million dollar mark in payouts. So kudos to him. Uh, I'm one of those people that gets some of that money occasionally. So all for people getting paid, whether you're that high level black belt or just random guy from random town competing on one of the cards. So bang through these things. Yes. Grappling rewind. So we're really going to quickly Hang go through on. the purple belt matches here. Just um, anything that really stood out, um, like people losing matches that they shouldn't have lost, people not finishing submissions that they shouldn't have finished, uh, like match one, where Zimmerman could have finished the match about seven million times. I don't know. He kept kept driving backwards when he had the Dars Anaconda, whatever position he was in at the time I was looking from the changing area, which was above the ring down, but he kept backing up and not locking it in. So he didn't finish it, but he was dominant the entire time. Wins via decision. Yeah. Um, that was, that was what you see a lot with fight to win, which is not against them. You only have X amount of time to finish. You see a lot of decisions. Some of them are exciting. Some of them, which we will get to later, blow. Uh, yeah, it was terrible. Um, after the first match, I disappeared briefly and was warming up. So Maine over here will probably be filling in some of the uh, details that I left out when it comes to this. Match two, James Dunn. Uh, wins basically via good positional work, strong dominant position, wins a decision. Match three, uh, Ty, this is what I'm going to pronounce his name as. Tadaya. Yeah, wins a contro- pretty controversial decision over a purple belt. Um, uh, Jared Bosk, uh, I've trained with Team Conquest before and his older brother, Kai. Um, I know Jared's a, a good wrestler. He had that sweet ankle pick at the beginning. Um but it was a lot of back and forth and the referees you know they i'm not going to say what they saw or not saw um they just went the other way there was some good submission attempts back and forth a lot of positional changes so i can't say a hundred percent for sure what they were looking for but they gave it to Tadaya, so we'll leave it at that i'm not going to question them at the moment on any decisions moving on to yeah. match four to match four we had Huntman uh, versus Ortiz which uh, that was I actually don't think it was Huntman it was Johnson which uh, Maine has kindly written down that was a last minute replacement supposedly the night before according to one of Ortiz's training partners and Johnson wins with a like a fast wrist lock from top side yeah so uh, Johnson was a late, late, late replacement because the previous opponent, who I'm assuming is Huntman, uh, got the flu the the day of weigh-ins. I, I don't know how that magically appears. I know the flu is prevalent, but get your flu shots, kids. Doesn't cause autism. <laughs> match five um, between... LaSalle and Robertson. That was my first match where I was kind of shocked how the judges chose um how they pick winners uh LaSalle 
was the aggressor from the beginning. Robertson pulled guard and stayed there and then played guard. Yeah, there wasn't really a whole lot of passing. There wasn't a lot of all. sweep attempts. There was a lot of pressuring from LaSalle. Got to over under, got through to half guard. Once. A couple, it's like two times, maybe three, but it was pressuring forward. And when it comes down to that, personally, as a referee, uh, when somebody's actually like looking to go and trying to sweep and trying to come up and still ends up no advantages, no anything, and you're left with that terrible decision of having to pick somebody, when somebody is more aggressive moving forward, uh, you normally go with that person. But again, you know, I wasn't one of the refs, so I can't say for sure. And, uh, yeah, that was that. Um, Hold up. We're back in. Cool. So as uh, Maine so kindly put for the uh, next matches, note details, Edwin has a head tattoo. Um, if I'm not mistaken, and I think I know where he trains, I'll have to ask him. Look like a Full Metal Alchemist tattoo. Shout out to all you uh, anime nerds out there that are going to make fun of me. He uh, also had a BGJ patch from Reddit. Yeah, which is so cool to see. Also, you know, dorky people of the internet unite there. And uh, Joseph wins a decision basically via mount. Ooh, and then right here, uh, Lori Porsche from Beta and Morgan Beverly from Roots, which is uh, an Atos affiliate. It's, uh, what's the tiny dude's name? Uh, he's been on like five, he lost to Kayo in like 15 seconds in the fight to win, and then he beat Josh uh, Josh in like two minutes. Looking at this, I'm looking at him, I can't figure, I can't, can't get the Zach name. Zach something. Yeah. It's Zach something, and it's going to bother me, and I'm going to yell about it in 15 minutes that I remembered his name. But he also did some of the announcing and screwed it up, which was hilarious during the card. Um, but uh, Morgan stole that one away and uh, nabbed the uh, knee bar. Mm-hmm. There was some, that was a double toe hold attempt uh, at one point in the match. You know, interesting match, good back and forth. Um, Man, Dead I took air. Terrible. I'm just looking. I'm trying to like give information about the competitors, and I took terrible notes. I was trying to do it on the fly because I was trying to like get You're the information. To watch. From, well, I was trying to get the information that they were announcing as they walked out. Yeah. Into the notes because I have someone finish the bar four and zero and fight to win. So yeah, Morgan Beverly from Atos is four and zero and fight to win at this point. Um, undefeated. Looked good. Uh, will it be interesting to see how she matches up in the future? As I assume that we'll see her on upcoming fight to win cards. Probably in the Jersey area, being is that her. Excuse me. Her gym is based in that general area, and they always do uh, title fights for each belt level, actually, which is pretty cool. Uh, match eight. Match eight. Dakota, Dakota Wader. Wider. Wader. Versus Tyler Murphy from Team Cal. Weirdest, weirdest name ever. You couldn't think of anything better than Team Kyle. Kyle what? Kyle who? Does this person have no arms and legs? Is it a redheaded Jew from Colorado town? We don't know. But it's Team Kyle. Uh, wins via heel hook in about a minute. Quick ones, quick ones, quick ones. After that, we move on to the brown belt matches. Ooh. Um, a match that was scheduled for match nine actually occurred after match. It was scheduled for match ten. Um, but... So we went with the Maggie Garmory from Big Brothers and Alexandra Coleman from Ground Control. Another local gym. It's right around the corner from uh, from our gym, actually. And it, from these notes, Coleman via Kamora. <laughs> oh, via sub attempts. I don't know. Maine's note taking is garbage. So let's actually redo that whole thing because that was that just makes no. You can't use any of that. You announce, uh, do you announce it back in the name because you have you're really good on the names. Okay, so we're going back to match nine now, jumping from match ten. Uh, match ten. So okay, match so ten that actually occurred. We're doing, so match ten, which was match nine. So Maggie oh. Garmory from Big Brother uh, versus Alexandra Coleman from Ground Control. I can't talk. I'm Tony the Tiger. So apparently. 
again, this is getting closer towards my match. So I was paying less and less attention to what was going on. But Alexandra wins by most sub attempts. Decision. Uh, decision, obviously. Uh, now we can get into a little bit more detail because at this point I'm just cooling down. And I can talk about people because I've competed against them or I'm really friendly with them. So we had match 11, 200-pound brown belt gi match Mateo Nunes from Amar Barbosa. We skipped one. Oh, we, we skipped did. Nine. We switched the Charles Gamble fight. Son yeah. of a... So the Charles Gamble match actually took place um, after match 10. So it was actually match... Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Charles Gamble is a giant man. How he made 200 pounds... I have no idea. Uh, Supposedly, he's fought at 205. I still find that hard to believe. He comes into our gym occasionally and trains, and he is enormous. Uh, He was against Darren Darren Costa. There we go. Can talk. From Alliance. I think that one's based out in Hartford County because it is a Maryland gym. It was a nice little back and forth. Both guys had big pickups, some, you know, belly-to-back stuff, some takedowns back and forth and we have Charles Darren, Gamble hits a big Hari Goshi and uh, Darren hits a big suplex throw. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And it Darren ended up with, with Darren with the decision, which he started picking up afterwards. Uh, he started really kicking in the hustle after that. I've seen him compete before and he's a, he's a, he's a good hustler. He moves it. So hats off to him. Now jumping back to match 11, 200-pound uh, brown belt gi match, Mateo Nunez from Amar Barbosa Jiu-Jitsu versus Josh Madison from Clinch Martial Arts. Uh, I have experience with Mateo. I competed against him when I was really fat. And um, from competing against him, he's got a, a good open guard, good lasso, good spidering techniques, you know, a la Amar Barbosa, obviously. So that match started, and from my vantage point up top, it goes nice, nice takedown by Mateo, who's got really good judo as well, and the match stops. And I thought at first that Josh had got cut, and then we noticed that Mateo's head was uh, erupting like a fire hydrant. And, you know, so so we're sitting there waiting. And I was about, uh, probably about five to ten feet away from the match and i saw as soon as the takedown happened mateo's head was cut and i was wondering okay apparently they're just gonna let it go because i saw there was a bunch of blood coming out of his head and they let it go for probably about additional 20 seconds before the ref steps in and they realize that mateo is leaking a significant amount of blood onto his white gi and into the face of the gentleman he's competing against Mm, aids yeah, that's uh, one thing where I know this would cost more money and it's some of the stuff is, I'm not going to say this is on the fly because, again, Seth and his entire team put a hell of a lot of work into this, but there are no blood testing going on. So hopefully nobody's like, hey, I don't have a communicable disease. Psych. But um, eventually a medic eventually comes Eventually the out. medic comes ambling down the uh, walkway and they start poorly taping up Mateo. It would have been smarter to bring your whole little kit, clean it up, try to gob it up with a little bit of Vaseline at least or something, gauze it and start wrapping it properly. Uh, Mateo should have looked like a really cheap looking mummy. Uh, Instead, he just had a karate kid headband for a little bit. They gave him electrical tape and they taped electrical tape to his head with what looked like bathroom napkins and they restarted the match. Uh, From there... Mateo was just dominant, just, you know, working from half guard, trying to pass through, eventually getting passed, mounting, losing his head wrap. Sets up a really nice loop choke uh, at one point, super deep. Um, At that point, the ref continues to wipe the mat where Mateo is dripping blood. And then at certain points, we'll wipe the mat and then wipe Mateo's head uh, and continue the match. With about 44 seconds left in the match, um, they pause the match because Mateo's head wrap has come off and he's bleeding a bit much Everywhere. at this point. And uh, the medic comes back out with some duct tape at this point. Duct tapes his head properly so that he's not going to bleed more. Fixes and, um, everything. And then the match finishes. Mateo wins a you know pretty clean decision. A dominant 
mis- decision. Um, of all the matches I've ever seen, this is the bloodiest ski match I've ever seen. We have some photos, and I s- assume there's some photos up online. Oh, yeah, you can find Of it. Mateo's gi. A great match overall, but I've never seen a white gi that bloody. Um, yeah, actually, match. if you find uh, Mike Kalambas, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, he's got those pictures up there, so you'll be able to check that. I'm pretty sure that's at Mike Kalambas Photography on Instagram. Maybe it's just Mike Kalambas, but you'll be able to find it. Uh, moving on, the promoter pulled double duty. Seth Daniels from Easton BJJ took on Eric Modung- Modugno. Jesus Christ, I can't read. Um, from Bauerhaus. From Bauerhaus. Seth, if I'm not mistaken, what trained at the Olympic Training Center for judo was a high level judo player um, and is known for his foot sweeps. I believe he calls the one that he eventually ended up hitting the James Brown. The James Brown? No, the Rick James. That's what he calls it. The Rick James. Um, where beautiful he, foot sweep. Beautiful. He leads the matches your leg. Leads, reaches out, sweeps, and does a nice little spin and then comes in. Uh, surprisingly, it took him a few times to actually hit it. And then he finally nailed it, went after it hard, and hit a beautiful calf slicer. Toe hold, I think. Calf slicer. Really? Calf slicer. Okay. He talked about it right afterwards when he came down from the uh, walkway. Definitely a calf slicer. Uh, fantastic submission. Um, Fun match. Quick match, too. Quick. About then a minute he gets on the and mic. change. Gets on the mic. Starts promoting jujitsu like the awesome person that he is. Um, just starts pushing it, telling people to train jujitsu. It's amazing. Uh, I'm going to agree with that, obviously. I've been doing it for almost 11 years now. It's November, so 11 years. So, yeah, do that. Train jujitsu. Have fun. Come out to fight to win shows. Support them. Here it comes, folks. Here comes the most boring match in Fight to Win history. It edged out my previous match at Fight to Win for Most Boring Match where I got laid on top of and couldn't do anything. Uh, Shout out to uh, Edward McKay for keeping me in side control and keeping my fat ass pinned to the mat. Back when Josh was around 200 and... uh... I weighed in at 219 for that one. It was a 220 match, but hey, I uh, cut weight for that from 240. So... I was still really fat, but we'll get into Josh's weight loss here <laughs> later. We'll speak about his match in a few matches here. Yeah. Um, so this is Kamal Shalarus. Yes. The MMA fighter, uh, fighting at 195 pounds. The guy fought MMA this year at 155 and decided, Hey, this is a great idea to fight a no gi match. 40 pounds up. He looked soft. S a W F T soft. Also, no rash guard. So I think he was one of the few guys on the card that actually pulled the rash guard off. Uh, you know, let ADCC the donuts out. And uh, versus Tim Dawson, who I am also familiar with, uh, had a match when we were blue belts. Strong, awesome dude, super friendly. Uh, Kamal Shalarus had not had didn't want to have anything to do with um, a grappling match. Apparently, he signed up thinking that he was going to punch somebody. I guess I don't know, but he did. Fuck all. I hate being disparaging against competitors, but he literally did nothing. Yeah, they were going for takedowns, and then as and soon that's, as that's Dawson generous. would attempt a takedown, um, if the takedown didn't happen, Dawson would go to the ground, he would sit, and then he would you know, look forward to Kamal to engage on the ground. Um, at a certain point in the match, Kamal actually walked away and turned his back to Dawson. Um, I'm not actually certain what the rules are for stand-up, or stand-ups, or um, onus to engage on the ground, but eventually Tim Dawson would stand back up, and they would go through takedowns again. Uh, This match actually got some boos from the crowd, which is something I did not hear any other time in the event. There was was, uh, hissing as well. There was booing and hissing. Audible hissing, which was amusing. Um, Yeah, Tim tried to pull to get him to come in. He kept going for, you know, he tried to grab the leg, he was doing everything he could, um, and for what I gathered, so this is secondhand information, it's not always 100% accurate, um, Kamal then told Tim after the match, after he lost by a split decision, which confused me because he shouldn't have gotten any nod for doing anything, um, he told Tim that he fucked him up. Uh, I don't know which planet or 
dimension he was in where he thought he saw that. But yeah, that was not good. Tim was not happy with the performance. Uh, threw his shoes as he came down the steps and uh, was just in general pissed as anyone should be that uh, somebody came to not compete. And this brings us to Mr. Weinstock's match. My match, which I'm going to be hypercritical about because I'm hypercritical of myself. Um, I'm going to be disparaging and say I'm absolutely horrible. This match took place at 175. Again, we keep talking about how fat I was. I'm still a fat kid on the inside. Um, last fight to win match I had was in April of this year, 2017. And I weighed in again at 220, 219. And I cut from 240. Um, previous to that. Previous to that, I got really fat because I thought powerlifting was super awesome. You're going to have to cut out that. Um when I met Josh a few years ago, he was roughly about 280 plus pounds. 286 at the peak, almost three bills. So in under two years, he's dropped about 100 plus pounds. 100 and let's see, 111 pounds to be exact. And in the commentary, it's uh, very interesting because they mention that Josh's previous match uh, occurred at a super heavyweight super heavyweight bracket. Shout out, by the way, to Jay Reichelbudo, who is an excellent commentator. Uh, anytime you get to hear him, listen to him. Very knowledgeable, awesome dude at Smash Pass J on Instagram. If you ever want to check him out, always posting interesting motivational stuff or him being up at six o'clock in the morning training, which is something that you should all do. Back to this tomfoolery. Uh, I came out ready to rock and roll. John came out ready to rock and roll. Um, and man, was I not expecting him to fire that quickly. I, uh, I, again, you're going to hear this a lot on this, is that I've competed against or know a lot of these people. I competed against John when I first got my purple belt years ago, and he started off a little slow, took his time, tried to shoot in, you know, takedowns, and I have, I have mediocre takedown defense, mediocre wrestling in general. It somehow has, has done me well over the years. But I did not expect him to move at that speed. And he shot in a single, outside single, and ripped that one down really quick. Got around in my half guard and immediately just started the pressure. Um, this, was, this was a big thing for all of Lloyd Irvin and his affiliate schools. They came out hard, quick, and heavy. And John was trying to rip my head off immediately and good for moves, him it immediately moves into a, a japanese neckties neck switching to dars is just crank 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 which helped him back up and lift up the knee to pop up to get into a great passing position which he did uh started to go through passed went around was attempting a few things settled in north south briefly tried for a key lock immediately came over knee on belly went to mount again this is making me sound terrible um which I would generally agree with. Um, he changed positions again as I was trying to trap the leg and went for a mounted triangle. I was not going to have any of that because I was not going to be able to get out of that. So I rolled my fat lumpy ass over and got him on the ground and immediately thought, uh, I'm going to power bomb this guy. I'm going to make this look like a straight up pro wrestling match. Fortunately for him, he's not an idiot and knew, hey, I should hook the leg, which he did. So I maybe got him two and a half feet off the ground. Uh, from there, I was like, it's party time. Let's go. Uh, dropped him down, immediately looked to pass. He rolled, started moving, trying to attack the legs, which is in no gi anyways my thing. I love playing footsie with people, getting you know, tangled up, letting people mess around, trying to do that. Uh, transitioned into a knee bar, which I was told later that was, you know, fairly tight, not tight enough because I was dumb enough not to finish it. So went for that, went for heel hook, went for toe hold, tried to come up on the calf slicer, tried to come up. He got up again, fired quicker than I did. And that was, again, the pace of the match was he was firing and I was hesitating. Um, he comes in back to the half guard. I, uh, 
I'm hesitating because I'm like, maybe I should do this. Maybe I should do that. Meh. Or as he starts to come in, I'm like, ooh, I should probably invert. And then I just sort of shrimped into him. And he just locked up a darse. And I was like, wow. Kurt Osiander would have said, you fucked up a long time ago. And I did. And he darsed me. And uh, I am not going to embarrass myself or my wife who is there or my brother or my teammates by doing the Harlem Shake on the ground because I'm unconscious. So I tapped. So hats off to John. He was, you know, super friendly, super nice guy. Very uh, complimentary on me not being fat anymore, uh, which I appreciate. Uh, I'm a sucker for all the, the guys that give me nice compliments. It makes me feel pretty. So... <laughs> Uh, on John on John Del Bruge, um, he they announced during the broadcast that he was a Brazilian national champion. Do you have any other information on that? Um, again, if you follow jujitsu, and this has nothing to do with anything else other than jujitsu, um, Lloyd gets his guys everywhere. He makes sure his dudes compete, his ladies compete everywhere. Doesn't matter where it is, they're going there. If you're ready to jump on the train and be part of that team and go at it, he'll be there for you. And I'm pretty sure John has been down to Brazil to compete in the Brazilian nationals. I know a lot of other guys have been there. I know JT was down there when he was with him. That's one of the times that he beat Laprie in the Gi, no less. Um, Laprie or Lang? Laprie, because Lange he had beaten before. Um, Laprie... Uh, I think he bow and arrow choked him. That's, you know, that's the way back machine as well. Um, but those guys have been all over the place. You know, DJ, Tim Spriggs, all those guys you see them popping up there. Brazil, Europe, Korea, just all over the world, Japan, wherever. They're competing all the time. They're getting help, not only from sponsors, but Lloyd is pushing that money in to make sure that he has a homegrown American team that is eventually going to produce a black belt gi world champion that is completely American homegrown, not like under Brazilian tutelage, anything like that. And those guys are getting really, really close. Um, I don't think DJ is competing in the gi anymore, so I don't think that's going to happen with him. But from the looks of some of these some of these competitors like Jameel Hill, like Array Alexander, like Tim Spriggs, like Ty Murphy. These, these guys are still competing in the gi and going to these big competitions and just hustling and beating people that you don't think that they should beat or losing matches where it makes you think maybe he shouldn't have lost that. So again, awesome, awesome match. He was, he was awesome. He was definitely the better guy uh, tonight. And, you know, if we competed again, he might be the better guy that night. I don't know. Uh, it was fun. I had a good time. Can't complain. Made mistakes. I've already written notes. I've already yelled at myself, to myself, out loud. Fortunately, no one was around to think I was super crazy. Um, yeah, that was the end of that match. Props to him. So, yeah. Move- Going back in. Kelly Quinn. Um, I, I, I hate your, your hair. I hate that you have that reverse mushroom thing. Uh, I know you're a great competitor, but, and I, I, I'm such an old curmudgeon. I'm, I want you to have a regular haircut. I'm sorry. I love you as a person, but your haircut bothers me. I wish you would just let it down or cut it or something. You're not a samurai. He does finish an outstanding flying triangle though. In like... 30, Negative seconds. seven seconds. It was so fast. Beautiful. You know, jumps it, locks it in, takes him to the ground, um, makes a couple adjustments to it, and then gets the tap. Yeah. So at this point, now moving on to the next match, uh, Vanessa Griffin from Crazy 88. Again, here comes another Lloyd person versus uh, Brittany Elkins from The Compound. Don't know where that is. We should do more research and figure out where all these gyms are. Um, at this point, I'm walking around uh, in a pair of short shorts and a jacket, talking to people and trying not to cry because I'm a little child. 
that didn't get his way. Uh, so take so, it away, Maine, on that one. Yeah, Brittany is 8-2 uh, and two in fight to win. Uh, it's a Shh. good match. Uh, she's going against two-time Pan American champion and two-time world champion Vanessa, um, who... Now that I think back onto it, Brittany actually works for Fight to Win, if I'm not mistaken. The she, compound is out of Colorado. There, yes. there we go. Yep. So, boom. Yes. So, she works for them. She runs their cameras, does some other stuff underneath the mat, I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure she fights MMA, too. Took a really short notice fight right before a Fight to Win as well and won that one. So, props to her. I'm just, you know, I do 8 billion things all the time and I can't remember anything unless it's obscure about some 1980s movie. Yep. Vanessa wins, a uh, very technical guard pass, uh, finishes a Kimura from the top. Good match overall. If you're going to watch a match on the card, uh, it's definitely one to take a look at. Absolutely. On a match 17. Uh, Gary Gioni, which people kept saying Gianni. Uh, there is no A in there. It's Gioni. From Pedro Sowers versus Nicholas First from... Demetrius Christos Jiu-Jitsu, which is an affiliate of Revolution BJJ in Virginia. Uh, no, Gary. I haven't competed against him. Talk to him every once in a while. Say what's up to him when we are out and about. Um, he loves the legs. He loves attacking the legs. And that was very evident throughout the entire match. He was hunting. Hunting, hunting, hunting. Toe holds. Uh, he does this small little variation on foot locks. It's not exactly a straight foot lock. It's not an esteem lock, but he just does this different angle. He loves going belly down on it to finish it, tacking the arm bars. Not saying that Nicholas Frust, I think it was first. They might have uh, misspelled it on the card, but we'll go with, I'm going to say first because I'm a jerk. Um, also hunting, he wanted the back, something fierce, kept rolling under, didn't give any cares about his feet being taken off, anything like that. He just went and went and went, kept trying for the back, kept going through. Gary tried to pull a triangle super early in the match. He started to try to pass, pinning it down. It was a good, good match, but Gary was just a beat ahead of him. And um, this is further proof that people can't get mad when people spell the name Gary differently with one or two R's, so you can't get mad when somebody spells Gary Tonin with one R because Gary can be spelled multiple ways. But this is Gary Gioni, also plays with the feet. Awesome. He wins by decision. Really good match as well. Excellent. Going on to match 18. Yes, that's match 18. There's still 13 more matches, including this one. This is the last of the brown belt matches. After this, we're going to move into the black belt matches. Yes, indeed. This is Josh Pike from Atos versus Jared Chumley from Tiger Shark BJJ. Again, I'm moving around. So he's Maine is going to fill you in on some of these things. I'm bouncing around, talking to people, making sure everybody's warm, geeking, about, geeking out about people wearing pro wrestling t-shirts, things like that. Uh, talking to uh, one of my sponsors, which I, you know, not that I felt obligated to, but you know, he helped get me there. So I'm going to talk to him, even though he did not remove his eyes from the mat pretty much the entire night. So this match was the first slam of the night. Um, Big slam. Yeah, nice slam. You know, that's like to see that in the rule set. I always like to see slams being utilized when they're available. Um, just kind of remind you where BGJ comes from and that, you know, you can't just let someone uh, lift you up. Uh, we have Josh Pike from Atos. He rolls through for a nice arm bar. Um, super smooth for the finish. Again, a good match, good slam. All right, now comes black belts. And they started off with the big boys. And they also used the smallest ref to ref what was announced as 550 pounds in the ring. And you got a 115-pound ref to ref the match. So essentially, it was like sumo wrestlers and a child in the match. So you have Kim Sturdivant, I think I'm saying that right, from A-Force versus Jeff Manalanson from Pedro Sauer. I am familiar with both of these guys because I was fat at one point. Um, I actually just recently rolled with Kim. He rolled into our gym a couple of weeks ago. You know, heavy pressure passing game, good guard game. And my very first brown belt match was actually against Jeff Manalanson at 
against super heavyweight. He was close to 300 pounds at that point. I was close to 300 pounds at that point. Um, it was good. I knew I was going to have better cardio and I had a really tight gi on on purpose because I knew he knew judo. So I didn't want him grabbing on and doing anything with that. Uh, and uh, it took a while, but I got the finish on that. Not poo-pooing on Jeff's skills. Jeff has great skills. He gets out there, supports a good cause. Uh, is a rep for Mission 22. Um, check him out if you ever see him. Super friendly dude. Uh, good referee as well. Um, it was a heavyweight match. What do you expect? Somebody to run into somebody and either take them down or yank them down, which is what happened. Kim grabbed that gi and hit a hard snap down. And from there, he just kept the pressure on top, kept the pressure on. And Jeff, you know, kept the arms in tight, kept the defense going and just put his hand in the wrong place. And Kim just nailed a wrist lock off of it. Super, super, super tight. Uh, knocked it in and called it a day. Um, going on tinier black belts. Now, no gi match, uh, Scott dance from district martial arts versus Daniel Keene from Alliance. Daniel also swings in our gym regularly comes and trains, uh, solid dude. Good game. Uh, very back and forth. Um, it was a hard one to call. I wasn't going to, you know, my, excuse me, my, uh, my experience would make me lean towards Daniel just because I trained with him, but that's why I wasn't, you know, one of the referees picking who won. Um, it was a lot of good back and forth. Maine, do you have anything else to fill in on that one? No, good back and forth match overall. Um, nice standing guillotine attempts from Danny. Uh, always excited to see guys go for the sub on the feet. Uh, good back and forth match. Eventually Scott shoots for a straight ankle lock and um, doesn't quite finish it. Time runs out. Uh, ends up winning the decision over Danny there. Yep. Going through again now, back into the gi. Marcelo Matos from Tiger Shark versus Matt Schellenschlager from Conquest. Again, surprise, another person that I know and I've trained with before. Um, the week before the Baltimore card, the Frederick card, Maryland card, whatever you want to call it, uh, Matt was a late replacement against Wilson Hayes. Um, and got caught, if you haven't seen it, you can find it somewhere on YouTube. Or flowgrappling.com and check out Fight to Win 52 from Philly. Matt got caught in a Kimura that I don't know how he didn't tap to it. That was the previous week versus Wilson Hayes. But he said, suck it, I'm going to keep competing anyway. And went in there and did his thing, you know. Mateos pulls guard, transitions to a toehold, Matt escapes. There's really a lot of technical grip fighting that happens in this match. Uh, eventually, land, they land in 50-50. Match gets reset. Uh, a lot of technical groundwork, some knee cuts for Matt, goes for an ankle lock. Um, and then Matt Schlinger. Schellenschlager. Schellenschlager ends up winning the decision at the end. Again, another good match. This whole card was full of just fantastic matchups and matchups. Fantastic. From each competitor. Uh, if you want to rewatch the event, you know, I would highly recommend it. It was just fantastic. Flowgrappling.com. We are not paid by them, but you know, don't be a jerk and steal it. Technically, Josh's. You know, what he competes. Uh, Flow grappling doesn't pay fight to win. Fight to win pays fight to win. Moving on, <laughs> gi match again. Here comes another one. Cesar uh, Paredes. Uh, again, I'm uh, Cesar. I don't know. Caesar, whatever it is, uh, from Pedro Sour versus what is on the uh, program is Colin Stewart. That is not his name. And what it is on Facebook is it looks like it's Colan Stubard. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's got awesome foreign parents that named him awesomely, but Colin Stewart is way easier to say, so we'll go with that. Uh, Colin randomly showed up at our gym one day and was like, hey, uh, I used to train here. Can I come to your open mats? And nobody was upset that he showed up. Uh, solid black belt, uh, Hobson Morial lineage. Uh, is out of Philly, his, uh, his teacher. This match was awesome, and what I found out later was Colin was not too happy that uh, Cesar gave him bunny ears at the weigh-ins. They went to take a picture, and Colin was being the nicest dude ever, because that's what he is. 
Uh, and just, you know, did the whole hand around the waist. What's up, bro? Kind of, we're going to take this picture. And Cesar uh, gave him bunny ears. And that apparently pissed Colin off. Um, Colin came out looking uh, very intense he, for the match and for the duration of the match, really. He, and he never looks that way. This is a guy that always has a smile on his face, always ready to train, have fun. It's super complimentary, even if you just suck the entire round and he uh, gracefully didn't beat the ever-loving shit out of you. Um, super sweet guy. But he just looked pissed. And he hit an uh, awesome foot sweep. And from there, just gave him the business. Passed the guard, went through, just buried all that chest hair, that hamburger meat in Cesar's face for the entirety of the match. People were getting pissed that it wasn't moving. And I'm just, you know, yelling, giving instructions. And again, I was told, who from Baltimore BJJ is yelling out what I'm about to do? Stop doing that. And I'm looking at the match and knowing Colin's game a little bit, I was like, why isn't he doing this arm bar? Why isn't he doing this arm bar that's been here for four and a half minutes? Well, with about 10 seconds left, he transitions, nails the arm bar, finishes it, and just mean mugs it. I'm like, damn. Colin is a gangster. And he just went in, shook hands, you know, went about his business, very polite, went through and, and did his thing. Yeah. But whew, you it want was to look just... at a match for how to hold north south and how to just have outstanding top pressure and control. Oh, this is a match to watch. Beautiful. Uh, Cesar was both feet in the lapel trying to launch him forward, and Colin was having none of it. He was not budging, he didn't feel like moving. He essentially did the physical equivalent of or gnaw to uh, Cesar the entire match until he tapped him. Moving on to the the 125-pound black belt nogi match. Uh, disclaimer, Joshua Peters from CPMMA has never been 125 pounds in his entire life unless he's wearing all of his clothes and a backpack with bricks in them. And has his keys in his pocket. Notoriously, no Josh toys. Peters weighs in in jeans with his keys in his pocket and still weighs below 125, you know, but always Josh game, Peters always is shows a, up. is a small man. He goes by the Hebrew hammer because uh, he is a Jew, but I am almost 100% positive his nickname should be Gollum. Um, that is no offense to him. Again, somebody I know and I've competed against. Yes, I was a fat guy in the absolute division competing against a 115-pound man. Um it was amusing. He yelled Leroy Jenkins at me. Uh, he was versus Christopher Tran from Crazy 88. And again, surprise, guess what? Christopher Tran, boom, off the bat, just starts going at it. A lot of, you know, movement. And at that point, again, I had to disappear. So leave it to Maine to be sitting ringside and fill in the rest of the details from there. Yeah, really good match. Um... Christopher Tran is actually a Nogi Pan American champion. Uh, so, you know, you, you look at the credentials that comes with that. Uh, Tram, Just Peters pulls guard initially. Tram goes for a knee cut, ends up in top quarter guard. Peters passes and shoots a leg lock. Yeah, Chris Tran just turned on the next gear after Peters, you know, was going at it and just stayed a, a step above. That's, that's no knock on Josh Peters. I've watched him at a Naga one time hang in there and you know, really make Jameel Hill, who is, again, way bigger than him, have to work. Now, Jameel Hill, again, somebody that, you know, went at it with Cobrinha and met it. My personal opinion, I think Cobrinha was gifted that decision in that fight. But that's neither here nor there. Jameel is legit, and we'll just go with that. Um, Match ends with um, both of them shooting mirrored heel hook attempts, and then the time runs out. And Tran takes the decision. Uh, moving on to, again, larger uh, gentleman, 215 black belt gi match, Ken Brown, who was way more than 215 a couple of years ago uh, from second gear jujitsu. And that's not a knock on him. Good for him to getting down that low. He used to, used to be big yeah. like me. Ken uh, Brown is actually the 2013 uh, European champion. I think and... he's taken some, some world's placings as well. Ken is a 
serious, serious competitor, Ser- seriously nice dude as well. Um, and he took on Isaac July Jr. from Big Brother Jiu-Jitsu, who is a very intimidating coach. I was a referee, and he was coaching, and man, um, I may have thought about peeing in my pants before while he was yelling in excitement. Uh, very, very uh, intense dude, and a very intense match. Um Ken Brown is known for his deep half guard. That's what he does. And you would not expect a 200 plus pound man that isn't, you know, isn't a world champion Brazilian guy doing deep half. You know, you think, okay, Bernardo Faria, that's who I think of as deep half with big dudes. Um, Ken Brown's right there. Ken Brown is serious business with his deep half and immediately started attacking. Um, Isaac was going after it he was moving and grooving you know almost got passed through ken continually looking for sweeps um eventually knocks him knocks him down but isaac goes hits another hits a beautiful butterfly sweep beautiful butterfly sweep to get back on top it was just a lot of back and forth and uh if you wanted to look up a picture of somebody that had no fucks to give Ken Brown's face would, would be there because it looked like he not only was he chewing a piece of gum, but he just looked like he was taking a stroll in the park and he just was going, going, going. He almost getting closer towards the end of the match, nailed another deep half. July just bounced off of it and turned it around and came up. I mean, it was very, very back and forth and very grip dependent moving around and technical it was a beautiful match to watch and Isaac goes to pass in the dying seconds of the match and Ken immediately starts to shoot up an arm bar um it was close and maybe because of where I was it looked like Isaac was winning um I'm not gonna say he won or not because again I have a terrible case of ADD. I, I don't pay, I start moving around because I'm super fidgety, which you'll hear on the recording of me tapping on everything. Um, but it was too, it, the decision went to Ken Brown, but I, I'm not mad at that at all. It was, it was a great match. One of, one of the best matches on the card showcasing that big guys can move and they're not boring. So hats Good off match. to both of them. Yes. Excellent match. Moving on. Match 25. 25. That's right, folks. We're at 25, and we're still not done. 185, black belt, no gi match. Dave Porter, Pedro Sauer versus Ty Murphy. Crazy 88. Another Lloyd guy. You know, this Another card, Lloyd this guy. card guys a lot of Lloyd guys on it. Stacked up and down with Lloyd dudes, and it shouldn't be a surprise. You know, it's Maryland. That's where Lloyd is based out of. Those guys are going to get on the card. The main event and co-main event, two of those guys were from Lloyd's. The you know no gi champion in that weight class is DJ Jackson from Lloyd. So of course you're gonna get a lot of those people supporting. They always bring tons of guys. If you've ever been at Worlds or any of the bigger tournaments, you're gonna have Lloyd's cheering section. You're gonna have those guys. They're yelling. They're carrying on. They're supporting their team members. Again, purely jujitsu. I'm, I'm not talking about anything else. I don't want to hear about your opinions those are things that you can discuss elsewhere we're literally just talking about jujitsu so no politics just jujitsu um great match a lot of good tying up good wrestling uh porter is known for his darces his you know solid positional fundamentals but also you know some of some crazier positions too um Murphy also, you know, super explosive, known for having a high pace, you know, really pushing it again, good fundamentals. And that's how it went. And, you know, he, he stayed one step ahead. Um, That's where it went. There were some good submission attempts and things like that, but Ty stayed up. Uh, Main, your thoughts on, on that one. No, everything you said, you know, both guys were really explosive, moving, high-paced match. It was, uh, there was a lot of back and forth, and, you know, Ty wins the decision. 
Yeah, it was a good fight. Uh, David is a super active competitor. So is, is Ty. Um, I just happened to run into Dave way more. Um, and as he talked about, you know, he said you know, he wasn't upset that he lost. I mean, you're always bummed when you lose, but it was a good match. It's nothing to be upset about. Uh, getting into the female part of the card, um, the ladies were going after it. That's one of the things, too, that I appreciate is they're putting the ladies on the matches and they're getting up there in the card and they're working it. And sometimes the female matches are way, 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 way more exciting than the male matches. So this is a 170-pound black belt gi match. Uh, Maria Maliesic, uh, I'm going to assume that's right, from Amar Barbosa Jiu-Jitsu. I think that's Amar's girlfriend, fiance, something like that. I know they are connected at le- in a relationship Versus uh, Maya Matalon from 5050 Jiu Jitsu in Virginia. Ryan Hall, obviously. And Maya uh, is a 2015 world champion. And Maria is a four time world champion, I'm guessing, throughout the belts. Uh, I don't recall that she won a black belt world title, but uh, again, we kind of slacked on extra note taking. So. We'll look that up and probably put it in the footnotes that, hey, yes, she was, or no, she wasn't. And it's no, to get a world championship at any belt level is impressive anyway. Uh, but they also didn't announce that she was black belt world champion. So I think they were smart with the wording. If she wasn't, if she was, hats off to her because that's pure beast mode. Um, Maria pulled guard almost immediately, and Maya just started punching through, trying to get through passed but got a leg caught up uh almost got caught in something transitioned around a lot of movement uh maria played a lot of guard just played guard just kept moving and going and maya kept trying to pass and everything and maya just made that one tiny mistake and maria transitioned over grabbed the leg and just finished the knee bar and grabbed her at about about four minutes in i would say something like that oops Um, yeah, so it was, it was a good match and I think Maya just made a slight mistake and, um, got caught. There was nothing, nothing to knock about it. It was still a a really good card, um, or a really good match. Excuse me. We're back. So listed, it was supposed to be the female black belt flyweight title, but they thought better of it and put the title match after uh, regular match. Uh, so listed as match 27 was the black belt flyweight title match female, but actually the 155 pound black belt key match with Jamil Hill from team Lloyd Irvin versus Joseph Overstreet from Noel Smith, BJJ. Awesome match. Um, I told Maine, I, I know he was taking notes, but I told him to look at the technical aspect of it more so than the match itself and what Jamil was doing with his grip placement and how he was pressuring Joe's legs to get around and move and to help Jamil keep himself at least one step ahead of anything Joseph was doing. You know, he just had the beat on him from the get-go. And again, attack, 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 fast, and just on the move immediately and Jamil just stayed up stayed up stayed up stayed up stayed up was consistently pushing and that's no knock against Joe Joe was you know game was staying in there he was trying to attack and go but just kept getting beaten to that next position every single time and eventually Jamil ended up on the back um did he get caught in the sub I thought yeah. that oh okay so yeah, he gets caught with the sub. I, I thought the uh the time had ended and they just stopped so maybe you know I got a little fuzzy on that, but it, it could be when I, the notes I have, it looks like Shane takes top mount and finishes the choke from the top. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cause that's where he was. And I thought time had just run out, yeah. but I was so just deep into watching hand and foot placement and how he's cutting across and how he was moving the gi and how he was pinning different appendages down to even be paying attention to the amount of time that was on there or not 
and it, I mean, it was just a beautiful display of jujitsu. Uh, fantastic match. Yeah, Shane uh, Jamal Hill is a really a highlight reel guy. If you go on onto YouTube, you can find a number of you know highlights with him at Worlds and his matches. Highly active, lots of transitions, and always hunting for a dominant position. You know, great match overall. Beautiful match. So then again, switching back. Now we're going to the female black belt flyweight title with Array Alexander from Team Lloyd Irvin versus Talita Alencar from Alliance Cobrinha. Um, Talita, world champion at black belt, you know, beast competitor. I know Lloyd puts out great women. I hadn't heard of Array at all, and that might be my fault for not just paying attention. So my first assumption was, okay, Talita's going to take this. But I just watched, and and Array just looked bigger than Talita, and I was like, hmm, this this might actually be interesting. And man, barn burner, barn burner. Uh, Talita came out hard and heavy at first, and you know did what Lloyd had, Lloyd's people had been doing all night, and you know came out hard and heavy and just started moving, trying to pass from over under, trying to pass from double unders, just trying to move. Um, some of the wardrobe was interesting in this There match. were several wardrobe malfunctions. Um, and that... Uh, sometimes that's just uncomfortable. I, I, this isn't a... As a female competitor, I, I couldn't say. Uh, that'd be something more for Maine's girlfriend to let you know what you need to wear. But she felt that uh, some of the wardrobe choices were not that smart. And that's why these uh, slight wardrobe malfunctions were happening. Talita did have a great grip on the pants and started pulling. And it's what happens when pants come down all the time. But there credit was, to the ref, you know, credit to the ref stop, for stopping it, keeps it the pulling grip, up the pants, fixes but the kept pants. the grip, things like that. You know, the top started moving a little bit. We had a little bit of fix on that, kept up on it. Uh, the thing was Talita started slowing down later in the match. And that's when... Array started really turning it on. And if I'm saying her name wrong, I apologize. I believe that's how they said it on the thing. Okay. Now, Alexander Array is, uh, they said, I think she was a five or six time world champion. I'm not sure at what level. Going probably she's a world again champion. through the belts. Probably blue, you purple, know. brown. I don't recall her winning a black belt. I think she's a new black belt. But again, I could be wrong yeah. too. But I think Looks it's fantastic. through the belt. She was on the move and she kept that same <laughs> pace throughout the entire match and she was just push 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 Toledo was visibly tired you could see that she was like let's finish this which led to a race nagging an omoplata uh and just looking for something looking to try to finish near the end of the match she did not get it you know more transitioning everything and she was pushing 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 time went and you know based on the be- first 70% of the match Talita took the uh, title, but hopefully Array will be back on the scene. Great competitor. She was really moving and grooving. Uh, great to watch um, and shows that she can keep up with the top of the heap when it comes to female jiu-jitsu. So look forward to seeing her in uh, future matches and looking out for her in tournaments that are played either online or on flow or whatever. Yeah, if you're gonna rewatch a match from this event, I would highly recommend One watch of- rewatch this match. It was just a fantastic, fantastic back and forth and really shows, you know, the top level female jujitsu in the world. I'd highly recommend rewatch this match. Yeah. Now now we're getting down to the nitty gritty of the nitty gritty. Co main event, black belt gi, heavyweight title, Tim Sprague's Team Lloyd Irvin, uh, versus uh, Leonardo Noguera from Alliance. Uh, Noguera, world champion, Spriggs, certified man machine. The dude is a monster. Both are monsters. Um, and this match went, and what happened with Spriggs did what every other Lloyd guy was doing, came out hard. He threw a Marote Sanagi over and over as hard as I've ever seen anyone throw And he calls one. that he he calls it the train wreck and he does it all 
the time. It's his highlight reel takedown. Always. And he dumps dudes. And Leo was no exception. He was throwing him. But Leo was just quick on the uptake and kept popping back up before he get down. Or Tim didn't finish it all away. But Tim, throughout the entire match, first of all, didn't look like he was in a match because he didn't look that sweaty. Which surprised me. For the amount of like working and gripping and all that other stuff, he didn't look tired at all. And Nogueira looked visibly fatigued in part of the match at, at a certain point and, you know, started, you had the glisten of the sweat and everything. Tim didn't look tired. He looked like it was just another day of training in the gym. It, it, and he just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Really huge pace on this match. And, uh, you know, the mo- majority of the match was contested on the feet and you just saw sc- Spriggs get the gi grips and then do that train wreck throw over and over and shoot for it over and over and just push the pace on the feet, never really making a lull in the action. They you just regrip and then go again. And repeatedly almost threw uh himself and Nogueira into the table that uh a lot of my teammates were sitting at. Uh which was amusing. Um I almost got landed on yeah, at one point. Uh, Maine is now a very large man. Um he looks like a 16-year-old boy, actually. So, yeah, the 16-year-old child trying to catch two giant men would have been hilarious. Also, um, there's a picture of it some somewhere. Of our, some of our female uh, gym goers as well at one point looked like they tried to catch, and then afterwards were definitely running for the hills every time they would come over. I mean, that's probably another good almost 400 pounds of people flying towards a table. Um and it's it's hilarious because I understand why you're not going to make a barrier because then it starts to look like boxing or pro wrestling and you have to deal with athletic commissions and things like that. This is still technically jujitsu and you don't have to deal with it. As far as I know, in most states, I don't think Maryland really has anything to do with that when it comes to that. I don't type believe of... there's any commission sanctioning yeah. for... Um for these events now the only interesting thing that i think is that it's a technically a pro event you do have payouts for wins so that's the only thing where i think you potentially could have some commission involvement in but it's a super fight technically and there's no striking and yeah. commissions tend to not care unless there's striking involved i don't really think they have anything to do with what is still like yes it's a professional event but it's an amateur sport I don't right. know. It's it's a weird line that they walk, but it works, and it's awesome. And, and only at one point in the entire event did we have someone uh, come off the mats, and they fell onto kind of the walkout area, the little yeah. raised area. Um, so uh, over 30 matches, it wasn't really a problem. The refs were very good on the resets, um, you know, making sure that they stopped the action at appropriate times. And, you know, no one fell off, but it's just something going forward – that you know might be considered later down the line. I don't think they're planning on doing it unless they really, really have to. Um, it wasn't it a problem for, for this event. It wasn't really a problem. And honestly, if you're sitting up against the ring, you, you need to know that, hey, that might happen. But again, Spriggs' continual pressure was what won him the match. And it was a decision. And uh, I actually picked him to win. I was like, I'm pretty sure Spriggs is going to take this match. And he Hometown. did. Hometown. I don't think it was even a hometown like decision. I don't think it should have been a split decision, which it was. Um, it was definitely his match to lose, and he didn't lose it. And Nogueira just, I don't think, was ready for that continual forward pressure of Spriggs. And Spriggs is is someone that I watch. When he pops up, I watch those matches because it's always going to be exciting. You know, Whoever it is, no matter what you're doing, if you have an issue with the person's team or if you have an issue with that competitor, you still end up watching their matches to see what's going on. Look at um, not Muhammad Ali, who was also part of Team Lloyd Irvin, who's who's coaching at the event, who was coaching, uh, who's a beast. Um, what's his name? Who switches teams every two months? Um, uh, Dennis. Herbert Santos, not. Not Dylan Dennis. I don't care about Dylan Dennis at all. In the world of jiu-jitsu, he's done uh, nothing in the gi that I care about, nor in no gi. Um, that's neither here nor there. But 
um, Herba Santos. A lot of people don't like him. A lot of jujitsu people don't like him because he jumps ship all the time because he's got a bad attitude, whatever. Uh, I say, fuck that. You watch that dude's matches. It's fucking awesome. Like the way I explain his matches, there is always at least several uh, times I say, fuck, because the dude is just on another level of uh, fuckery when it comes to jujitsu. The guy throws caution to the wind and just goes for it. And it's something beautiful to watch. And competitors that have that are enjoyable to watch. Even competitors that do things that you don't like, that do Barambola, that do 50-50, that do worm guard, that do whatever, that bothers the shit out of you on a certain day or whatever. I don't like this because it's boring. When they throw caution to the wind and they just do shit, it's awesome. That's what makes jujitsu awesome. And that's what made this match between Tim Spriggs and Leo Nogueira awesome. Tim gave uh, less than zero fucks, negative five fucks, and just went after a world champion and said, I'm going to try to throw you and I'm going to try to beat the shit out of you. So hats off to Tim. Now is the uh, he is now the black belt gi heavyweight title holder for Fight to Win Pro. Which, which will be awesome. Lots of cool matches on the horizons with that, I feel. Um we could have a potential Herbert Santos if they decide to pull him in. There could be, uh, if they can somehow convince, let's see, um, Lowe, who's now at that weight, you know, uh, Nicholas Mergali, Keenan Cornelius. Yeah, there's some really fantastic uh, there, matchups there to be so made. There's so many matchups, heavyweight wise, that you could bring up that would be just must see jujitsu. Yeah, and Fight to Win seems to be doing it. I mean, if this card is any indication of the level of talent that they are committed to bringing, you know, to the stage, you know, we have, I want to say, you know, twenty plus world champions, not world champion, world champion finishes on this card alone. You know, guys with three and four and two world championships competing on this event at various Just, levels. They're pulling guys in, and it's great that they are doing that. And you know, whether they're spending a ton of money to put them on, I, I don't care. And they don't care either because they're putting these on consistently. You've got former UFC guys. You've got world champions, current and past. You've you've just got people that want to compete, and it's only a win for everybody that watches jujitsu. Fantastic. And the gi and no gi, which is great because there's been more recently less and less gi events being showcased. And I'm one of those people that will tell you to go fuck yourself that you think uh, gi jujitsu is boring. Um, Even the most boring of gi jujitsu matches has so much intricacy in it and detail to just show you so when people start complaining about it unless it's literally somebody pulls guard and they don't do anything else even even then i can't even say that because you the one guy couldn't pass guard and there's got to be a reason why the guy couldn't pass guard so you have to go back and watch the match again and see all the details even if it's 20 fucking minutes like you're gonna pick those things out all right that's what i do because i'm a dork when it comes to that and it, it really piques my interest. I'm going to so, stop rambling now. Let's go to so the main, the main event. event. Main event. Black belt, no gi, middleweight title. DJ Jackson, Team Lloyd Irvin <laughs> versus uh, Gilbert Dorino Burns, who is now Zenith BJJ under Drysdale. Used to be Atos. I think used to be something else as well. Currently, fights, at the, currently fights in the UFC. Still took the time off to come to Maryland. And compete, former world champion, no gi world champion, high level dude, DJ, no gi world champion. Pretty sure he's got world championships at the colored belts. Like, oh yeah, is a fire hydrant of a human being. Like the is, fact that he's eighty five just is baffling to me, given his I think stature. He competes at that. I think he fights MMA at seventy. Um, but again. He, <sighs> He is a he is a large individual for not being very tall. He's big. He's a big human being. Um, his walkout song got stuck in my head for two days. Um, he that, walks out to that, "Go DJ" by uh, Big Timers. Yeah, that that bothered. That was the only thing that bothered me. I love that song. That song got fucking stuck in my head, so I'm randomly walking around going "Go DJ." That's my DJ, and I was like, "Oh God." 
but fantastic match. Great match. Um, my uh, some of my friends were making side bets on who would win, and I somehow got duped against betting against DJ, and against my better judgment, I I, I bet against Burns. Um, he uh. <laughs> I just DJ in these type of matches always has the advantage. Uh, I would never go against that. He's beaten countless dudes, countless ways, and just knows how to game people. And, you know, some people might think this boring. Um, He took his time, pressured, kept a world champion jujitsu, jujitsu player down and unable to do anything. There was one time, where he could have got caught, could have, but he pulled his his T Rex limbs out of it and and called it a day. And that's it's not a knock on DJ. I also have T Rex limbs. I have I am also short and stumpy, but he really maximizes it. Uh, just went after it, takedowns, staying on top, heavy, heavy, heavy pressure. You know, trying for the Kimura, trying to go around, just whatever, and. Dorino didn't really have an answer for that, you know, didn't really fully kick it in until like the last 30 seconds where he was going to try to do something, but it was already too late. And DJ just rode that all the way through. And it's, you know, he took the decision win and people go, well, it's what he normally does. No, his last like two or three fight to win fights, he's won by submission. So you can't say, oh, he doesn't do anything because he submitted people. I think he neck cranked the last guy and he submitted somebody with like a Kimura before that. This was just, you know, he didn't get the chance because he's going against a super high-level dude, and that guy just happened to keep himself, you know, in tight and away. But it was a good fight and a good end to a great card. Yeah, DJ Jackson retains 185-pound yeah, title. 25 pounds in his pants. It, via, via split decision. You know, it was overall just a fantastic card. And, great, um, top to bottom. Yeah, the level of talent, the matchups, um, even you know from purple belt all the way up to the black belt matches, these guys put a card together that was absolutely fantastic. One of the best grappling cards uh, I've seen in a long time. Yeah. Um, again, earlier throwback to uh, one of the guys that helped sponsor me, and you know got a bunch of people to go to it. Um, He's super fidgety and normally doesn't pay attention to something more than a couple minutes. And anytime I looked over at him, whether I was up in the warm up changing area or off to the side, his eyes were glued to the match. He didn't turn away from the mat. Like he was solely focused for 30 matches on the mat area. So what does that tell you about the jiu-jitsu in general? Even if it was a boring match, even if it was, you know, Kamal Shalarus running away and not doing anything, he watched the match. And again, Seth, his entire team, all those people, you know, as they call themselves, Team No Sleep, who worked tirelessly to put on these matches. It's awesome. I can't, you know, hats off to him. If you're looking for a pro event to either go to or be a part of, I'm going to point to fight to win every single time. Like they, they, the production, the way they treat the competitors, everything, you know, the professionalism that's extended to you as, you know, until you compete, you know, you, especially if you're just a random hobbyist, but you get to be on one of these cards Till you compete and get that money, you're not a pro, but it makes you feel like this is how a pro does it. It makes you, you know, you're working. They want you to sell tickets because they want to pay you more money. Like if, if, if it sells out, you get more money. So why wouldn't that give you an incentive to sell more tickets, you know, to get more people interested in jujitsu, to get more people to come, you know, I got my brother to come. My brother wasn't going to come. I was like, bro, let's go. And he came and he was like, that was awesome. He had to leave early because he had to be to work early the next day. But he's like, dude, thank you for getting me to come to this. I really appreciate this. My wife, I've been with my wife for 14 years. She went to one tournament one time when I started and was like, 
I'm not going to do this again because that shit's boring. And I was like, totally get it. And she came to a tournament like last year during the summer, but that was to take the kids to the beach when it was right outside of the tournament venue. She was like, I'm not watching this. This shit's boring. And I get it. And she sat there and she watched it and talked with people that talked about jujitsu. And she was like, that was really good. And it was exciting. And I liked it. She didn't say it was boring. So again, what does that tell you? Uh, that it's exciting. Support jujitsu. Support the things that are good for jujitsu. Support the companies that support jujitsu. You know, again, shout out to Seth and all of the people that, you know, run Fight to Win. Shout out to Fight to Win. Shout out to Flow Grappling for picking it up and letting more people see it. You know, getting those people out. And if if you're part of the Flow Network and you're watching it for wrestling technique or softball or CrossFit or lifting heavy things or swimming or gymnastics or rock climbing, all of these things that I've watched on the Flow Sports Network before, and I'm not ashamed to talk about it. Um, go to Flow Grappling and watch it. Find something. It's pretty interesting. Start training jujitsu. You know, I, I get there's not much more I'm going to say about it that's not going to be completely fucking redundant and isn't me just like gushing like a fangirl over something. But, you know, I'm always down to support something that I believe in and it's what I believe in. If you run into me and you say, hey, what about this tournament? What do you think of this? I'm going to say either A, yeah, go for it. It's a great idea. Or B, fuck that. It's shit. Don't support that that garbage. Um and it's already happening, but people are trying to bite off of the fight to win, you know, game plan and format and and use it and essentially make money off of it. But they're just going to end up shitting the bed because I don't think they have the passion that fight to win has for it. Um, I'm going to stop rambling about it and I'll let Maine finish anything that he has to say about it and has. Yeah. So in other news, uh, International Judo Federation has changed some rules. Some people are very upset about this, rightfully so. Fuck the IJF. They're dumb. Um, uh, what's funny is it's International Judo Federation. It's mostly run by French people, so it's not really international. It should just be called the French Judo Federation, which also um, exists. Yeah, but they're essentially the same thing. Basically, um, they've uh, made some changes. You should have different precedents. They made some dumb fucking changes. Go on, Maine. Basically, they've changed. Well, one one change I don't think is as dumb is they've changed uh, leg grabs. So basically, if you brush the legs accidentally, you no longer get DQ'd for it. Uh, it's not a shishito, which is basically just a, a <laughs> negative penalty point. That's a shito, not a shishito, which is a pepper. But um, yeah, so here, so instead of us instantly DQing you, uh, we're just going to say stop, start over, here's a penalty, and eventually you'll get DQ'd. Because guess what? We don't like people that know how to do these awesome fucking techniques that touch you know, your legs. look awesome, that touch your legs. Yeah, okay, I'm going to be bummed out if a whole bunch of wrestlers come into judo and just start shooting double legs and blasting into people. But, you know, the only thing it did in judo, they are like, oh, it's to make judo more exciting. It didn't fucking make judo more exciting. Judo has been always exciting. You just took out some techniques that you couldn't do. You know, you can't do leg wheels anymore. You can't fucking... You can't be Dr. Roddy Ferguson and pick fucking dudes up and launch them. That shit was awesome. But you still have guys throwing Seonagis, uh, Haragoshis, you know, all Uchimatas, sorts of Uchimatas, all, the, all you know. these things, you know, people doing sacrifice throws, you know, all sorts of stuff. You still have that. But now you're like, um, yeah, don't do that. Not we don't like legs. that. Here, don't grab so, this. For anyone you, wondering, uh, IJF banned leg grabs in about 2010. I thought it was 2008, but still, whatever it was, it was fucking stupid. It it muddled this sport even more into, oh, we're, we're trying to make it more exciting. Motherfucker, you know who watches judo? People that do judo and people that like grappling. Like nobody else watches judo. You know why people watch swimming? Cause it's on the fucking Olympics. If it wasn't on the Olympics, the only people that would like swimming are people that swim. Segwaying back, IJF also changed the golden rule score and 
you know, as uh, Maine so eloqu- eloquently put it, the Shishidos. Shido. Um, I just, just Shido's missed. Are yeah, penalty. why you got to call it out? Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm going to call you out. Uh, you can score off of bullshit throws now. So, again, yeah. trying to make things more exciting. When you fart and knock somebody over, you get half. A, you get a point, and you can win that way if you do that more than once. Basically, what used to be a lesser throw, used to uh, be you can now win on. Used to be an advantage, essentially, in jiu-jitsu, and now you can win by fucking advantages. Eat shit. This is the part of where we're not going to be serious, and I'm just going to yell at people and tell them to eat shit. Um, Reasonable. Uh, any any upcoming events that you're looking forward to? F- fight to win next week. Uh, I think the Brazilian Nationals in like two weeks. Uh, I so we're believe- probably touching on both oh, those. Ooh, not the Brazilian Nationals. It's the Abu Dhabi Grand Slam in ooh. Brazil. That's what that one is. That's exciting. Um, that's fucking awesome. Um, for all you super nerds that are into all forms of grappling, the next sumo tournament starts next week. I will talk about that. Fuck you. Um, Yokozuna. That's a WWF wrestler. Not That's not also a singular person. That's right. I know all about their shit. There's four of them right now. I can talk to you. First Japanese one in about twenty years, so that's exciting. That's only because you saw that shit on the internet that you know about that. The other three are are fucking Mongolian. Uh, Only two of them really fucking count because the other two are the Japanese one is eh. The one Mongolian one, I don't even know. That guy should retire. Uh, One of them's hit or miss sometimes, and the other one is the fucking god of sumo he's the, literally the best sumo guy ever and uh, argue with me about it because i'll tell you you're wrong and tell you you're dumb um actually i might talk about that in two weeks after the entire tournament is over but still i love sumo if you want to ke- keep up with sumo go into sure dog they have a a uh, a thread that follows it uh go on youtube and follow jason's all sumo channel or Kinta Mayama's sumo channel channel for highlights or NHK. They post highlights in English, which is um, great. NHK great. does a really good job for English viewers. Main, uh, main frequently would message me and be like, what do you think of this? What's going on? And I'm like, bro, this is what's happening. I don't give a shit about none of this right now. And mm. then we start talking about, you know, weird things like Egyptian sumo wrestlers and uh, fat Mongolian dudes that look like giant babies that, came out with tons of hype and now just shit the bed. Um, again, I am a fucking dork when it comes to a lot of these, uh, grappling things. Don't get me started on pro wrestling. Um, I, I still watch it. Yes. I'm a giant baby that likes men in spandex tights. Uh, so that'll do me. it for this. <laughs> that'll do it for this episode of the grappling rewind. Thanks for listening to our ramblings. If you have any questions, we don't have an email address at this time, but so we'll have one. Suck it. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Grappling Rewind. We'll be back next week with another episode.